Okay, hi, welcome back to Pizza Talk. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and I'm here today with Nikki Justo of Central Milling. I've been really looking forward to this session because we've been meeting with a lot of pizza makers and, and uh, planters and growers and, and people in the pizza industry, uh, and it always comes back to flour. The questions always come back to flour and choices that people make, and we said we're going to try to bring those to an expert, somebody who really knows the nuances, because now that everybody at home uh, wants to be an artisan baker and an artisan pizza maker. They want to know what the professionals know. And then even the professionals are still kind of coming up to speed. Um, I think they're catching up to the artisan bread movement, which is a few years ahead of the pizza movement in terms of understanding bread science, dough science, and uh, and the nuances of flour. So we've got Nikki Justo. Uh, Central Milling is, uh, you know, one of the major f uh, flour companies, especially within the artisan community, well known. The, the general public may not know it as central milling because you don't often see central milling flour on the shelves of supermarkets, but you do see it under somebody else's it's private labeling for a few companies, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you, and you're coming to us from, from Petaluma, right? Is that where you are, Petaluma, California? Or? I'm in Woodacre, California right now. So yeah. in Marin, on the Marin County side of the line? Correct, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And, We're pretty close to our, our uh, Petaluma facility. So uh, let's talk about that facility, if you could. Yeah. Can you hear the noise behind me? I'm sorry. That's okay. This is a Zoom world. We got all sorts of things. My sometimes my phone rings in the middle of this stuff. We just we just plow through, it and everybody forgives us because everybody's dealing with the same challenges. Okay. You know, okay. Actually, whatever that sound was, it, just, it I think it went away. I don't hear it. Um, do you hear it still? I'm I'm sorry. I'm having trouble hearing because it's so loud. Oh, so you got some noise. Well, let me close my window. Through. Hold on a second. It's not coming through the screen. All right. Oh yeah, I see it now. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Zoom World. Right. I had yeah. no idea the uh, gardeners were going to be here today. <laughs> you know that that happens to me once a week. There's a big there's a lawnmower sound outside when we do this, yeah. uh, so we get it. No, uh, but that. Nikki, let, let's let's talk about uh, Central Milling and the Artisan Baking Center, which is uh, located at your headquarters in Petaluma, uh, and and maybe bring people who are not uh, who have never been there or don't know about it, kind of. Up to up to the present time, and then we'll talk more about flour in the future, uh, and we'll and we'll see how far we can get. We're gonna we're gonna break this down into three episodes today, shorter episodes, so that we can kind of take it in bite sized pieces. And uh, let's just start with some backstory. So Great. tell us Great. a little bit of the central milling story, if you could. Okay, well we have uh, three milling facilities in northern Utah, about an hour and a half north of uh, uh, excuse me Salt Lake City, um, and. Uh, uh, two of them are dating back to the 1860s, um, and one of them has not stopped turning since it opened um, in 1867. That's our main mill in Logan, Utah. Um, and then we have our older facility, which is about two years older, up in uh, Richmond, uh, Utah, uh, and uh, in Collinson, Utah, is our whole wheat flour mill and cracker mill. And we're building a stone milling facility inside that right now as well, so we can do 100% stone milled flour. So milling is a series of mills that are located in that general area, but they were all at one time independent and they, you brought them under a central milling umbrella? Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great story how, how these mills were built. Uh, so when the Mormons came out and um, settled in Salt Lake City, um, and they would, uh, uh, the church would uh, want to uh, populate different parts of the state. So they would send groups out um, uh, to build a couple key things, a temple, flour mills, and get some farming going. And um, uh, the mills were the first things that were built in a lot of these communities. Oh. And we're the, the northernmost in Utah. Uh, uh, that was built. And then our flour mill was built the same year. And we share the same foundation, stone, and all that stuff. So there's some neat historical um, uh, uh, architecture there, which is pretty cool. And all those original buildings still stand today. Um, and our mill is just kind of built around it, but our main mill floor is the original mill floor and everything. But it so was a stone it, mill. They were stone. They would have had to have been stone mills back in the 1860s, right? And Correct. Then have you retrofitted them to have roller mills and other kinds of? Uh... 90s, they were uh, fitted with uh, roller mills. So, I mean, roller milling goes way back. A lot of people think it's a modern or, or a relatively modern situation, but no, in the 1890s, uh, we were uh, roller milling back then, uh, which is really interesting. Um, 
It's and only it's when you said in the uh, in the in the greater sphere of the of human history because it's about 120 30 years old. But as far as American history, it's uh, it's been you know like you said uh, well over 120 years that roller milling's been happening. Yes, yeah, quite a bit. Yes, and that was a huge breakthrough for those who are not in the sort of the the milling mindset that that bakers get into. Uh, you know the 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 way that you mill the flour. Uh, I'm sure rolling roller milling, which is what like. Uh, uh, steel, steel drums, homes. yes. They crush them, and they're just much faster and more efficient than stone mills, which are still there's a lot of what would you say uh, my mystery around them and a lot of myth and uh, and cachet around stone milling, but it's a much slower process. It is, yeah. It can be, um, but it can be efficient as well. I mean, that's why the t uh, that that part of milling hasn't gone away. I mean, there's still a, a want and a desire for it, and it has its place too because it does make you know. Very different flour than that comes than that that comes off of a roller mill, um, and it's just treated a little bit differently. Um, but if you run the stone mills correctly and are, and are patient for the slower outcome, I mean you're you're fine. I mean you can make some beautiful flour off of stone mills. I think one of the the notions out there about roller milling uh, and maybe even hammer milling, which is another milling development, yes. mm -hmm. uh, is that that they work at a higher temperature rate and that they might do damage to the nutrition or to the quality of the wheat. Is that, is that just a mischaracterization or is that true? Uh, can be true. Um, it's like buying a, a Ferrari, you know, you can, you can drive 200 miles an hour in it or you can drive 10 miles an hour in it. It all depends on how, how much you push in the gas pedal. You know, the same thing goes with roller mills. I mean, you can run those things slow and you can run them very fast, you know, and some big mills that are really out there to 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 push the limits of their production, their capabilities or their capacity, um, you know, do run them a lot faster than um, than some mills like us where we run them actually quite slow I see. Um, to minimize damage, to minimize heat development during the milling process. And, uh, you know, thus makes up, you know, a, a flower that tastes a little bit sweeter, which is really nice. So once again, you got to have to consider the source. Uh, roller mills, uh, roller milling from some uh, large mills might be at the high speed, high temperature level compared to what you're doing, which is say again more artisan approach. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's right because you can't go fast on a stone mill because if you do, uh, the heat will cause it all to gum up, and then you got to stop and clean all those grooves out of the stone. So that's yeah. one of the reasons why stone milling has that cachet of being slow and and yes. you know, sort of, again, more uh, maybe higher value. Uh, but again, in the end, it's all about getting the flour out of the wheat. You're transforming wheat kernels into flour. Exactly. And, yeah. and then be transformed later into dough. Correct, yes. And Central Milling has been doing it for a long time. Uh, and under this new umbrella of the local mills that you kind of brought together, how long has the current company, Central Milling as a brand, been around? Um, you know, because it, it's it, it, it hasn't been... So at my knowledge, Central Milling is, again, fairly recent in, the, in terms of the history of American flour mills. Correct, yes. Yeah, so Central Milling as a brand was uh, developed around 1996. Um, the mill was always called Central Mills or Central Milling, um, but uh, it never really had its own brand. It milled uh, a brand of flour called Red Rose oh. and, and Golden West. Uh, which uh, we still have those brands alive today, but they uh, we use them for our, our non-GMO, uh, our non-organic line, uh, where Centro Milling has become our strictly organic line of flour. And that's kind of, I think, again, the heart of what we're going to be talking about, because a couple of things that, that occurred, that's, that's what happens to my phone all the time, doing right. someone calls. And they only call when I'm on the air. They never call. Of course, when I'm on yeah. The air. Um, they... Uh, uh, so one of the things, uh, uh, recurrent themes that keep kind of popping up in some of the other interviews is number one, Ferrari as an analogy is like, everybody uses Ferrari as the analogy of like gold standard versus sort of like the Buick or the, or the Ford or the, you know, the yeah, to it. Yeah. Cause Ferrari is like, Oh yeah. Now, now I know what you're talking about. Uh, and then two, um, the, the, this idea of sort of, you know, people think flour is flour, but it isn't just flour. There's many types of flour. And then there's organic flour versus what we would maybe call commercial flour, right? Or whatever, non-organic flour, yes. which is the way that most flour is sold in stores. But organic flour has picked up an awful lot of traction in the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, exactly. Can you talk a little bit about what the differences are and why, why organic flour would be preferred? Yes. Um, 
Um, yeah, by some. Uh, so the organic farming obviously is, is a lot more difficult. It's um, you you can't put your chemicals on the land and you have to rely on natural sources of nitrogen inputs, you know, things like a, a chicken manure and a proper crop rotation, tilling under bean stock, um, things like that. Um, so, I mean, it really requires farmers to become farmers again, uh, where conventional farming um, nowadays, you know, you're able to put all sorts of nitrogen inputs, you can put, um, you know, chemicals in your land, you can do chem file, you can do no-till farming, I mean, you can do all these other things, you know, that technology and our, and our, and, and our chemical uh, industry comes up with to help plants grow faster and stronger and uh, quote-unquote better, but really it's um, in, at the detriment of the land, you know, the land yeah. pays the, the price. Um, and uh, so the organic farming is, is, it's better for the earth, obviously, because our, it's got us to this far. And we're now we're just starting to plug a bunch of stuff on there. But when it has a, how does it relate to flour? So um, the problem with organic farming is uh, you, since you, you're really dependent on the farmer's skill, you, you know, not every farmer is really good at it, you know, so you have varying qualities of wheat. Um, um, if you have, uh, uh, I have a, a weed infestation in one area and you have to spray down your crops, we might lose some acres. Um, we might have, uh, old, they might be growing an older variety of wheat um, organically and it's in an area with high wind and a lodge and they lose a lot of their crops. So there's a lot more risk involved with the farming of organic wheat. So it tightens the pool of yeah. available grain. So as a mill, what we gotta do is seek out all these different pockets of, um, and really latch onto farmers that are really good at it. And they have know? to be committed to that, uh, not only to their skill, but the, that means the, the earth itself, the soil itself has to be of a higher quality because you're not using chemicals and, and other things to enrich the soil yes. you're enriching it with all natural compost and things like that correct yeah so we, so we obviously scout, more yeah. expensive because uh does it affect the yield also is organic yields lower than say you know uh chemically fertilized yields not necessarily it depends on the farmer i mean we have a couple farms uh, one in particular that we deal with that out yields almost every one of our conventional farmers per acre um every single year but he's and in very <laughs> he's, in a, he's in a magical area. It's a closed loop water system. He has his own wells. He's, um, you know, deep volcanic uh, soil. I mean, he's got a um, property. Perfect situation for somebody who's been committed to organics, which is great. Yes. And so, he is. And I was just going to say, not every mill out there, you know, has, uh, you know, a commitment to organics. There are more, more and more companies are bringing organic lines on as they can find farmers as you have to grow that way. But uh, I know that a lot of, artisan bakers and, and certainly home bakers are seeking out, uh, you know, that for, for a lot of reasons. The, I, I've been tracking the organic movement since the 1970s when I had my little organic restaurant in Boston, Massachusetts, and that was way ahead of the curve, but we thought yeah. everybody would be doing this by 1980. And now here it is 2020 and still only a small percentage of people are committed to organics the way that, that you are, but you're serving a big part of that sector of the, of the uh, consumer market, right? Yes, yeah, and we're trying to grow our organic percentage every year. And currently, um, on, under our mills, well, I mean, we're close to ninety percent organic at this point. Um, so we're slowly sh um, closing down our conventional milling and that's, then increasing our organic milling. So we have two mills that basically run a hundred percent organic product. The one that has to do a little bit of flip flopping and purging and things like well, that. I would love to keep talking about this. And I know the people who are interested in this are going to want to know how can they get it? They don't know how to get it. How can they get that? So we'll talk about sort of how they can track you down uh, mm -hmm. through either through your website or, you know, we'll put the link up on our, on our site as well. Uh, but what we want to do is to kind of bring this segment to a close because the, the time is flying by and I want to be able to talk more about specific flower in the next segment. So um, Nikki, if you would come back for another round of pizza talk, you. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll invite all of you to join us back for the next episode of Pizza Talk with Nikki Justo, Central Milling. And also we'll talk a little bit about some of your, some of your recent accomplishments as a, not just as a miller, but as an artist and baker and a, and a representative of the United States at the, at the World Championships. Okay. So thanks, thank you for being with us on Pizza Talk. We'll see you at the next episode with Nikki Justo. Right. Thanks. Thank you.
We're back with Nikki Justo on Pizza Talk. Nikki, uh, uh, in, in the last uh, episode, we were talking a little bit about central milling and where it's all set up in Utah and a little bit of that history and organics. But I just realized that, you know, you're, you're probably what, like the fourth generation Justo in this, in the flower business? Is, Correct, am I yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Number four. And, and when I had my bakery, just up the road from Petaluma in Santa Rosa, uh, I used to buy my my flour from a guy named Keith Justo, <laughs> Uncle Keith, Keith Justo, yeah, who is who is your uncle, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and Keith and and so Keith was my guy. He was my flour guy. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he was at the Justo Flour Mill, which a lot of people recognize that brand name, Justo Flour. But then a few years later, after I sold the bakery and moved, I ran into Keith again, and he had started his own company. He had left the 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 family business, so to speak, and started his own milling which became central milling and that's when i finally met you because he then you came in can you tell a little bit of that uh you came in really not as not as a uh, sort of a a childhood grain prodigy or flour mill guy but but uh, you had a whole other life going and then you came into the business i did yeah yeah, yeah grandma uh grandma Justa, uh which was al justo's wife my grandfather um she uh, encouraged me to not get sucked into the family business uh, I was the first generation uh that didn't have to go into the family business to keep it going um so she encouraged me to uh do other things you know <laughs> and explore around and if i came back to the business great if i didn't that's fine too um but i just gravitated back towards it um and it was just when know, you thought it. you were out they pulled you back in <laughs> i know i know I, it's actually funny that I mean they even pushed me away even more. They're like, you don't want to be a part of this, you know. Right. You don't do it, don't do it. But yeah, I just, I, I don't know. It's, it's in the blood. I, and, I and, and, and you, uh, you know, it was in the blood, but you weren't really trained as a baker or anything else. So you had to learn all of it, kind of, you know, on the job. And then yeah. you got, and then next thing I see you, one time you're just learning the business. And then when, next time I run into you, you're now you're into baking side of it. And before I know it, you're you're representing the United States at the Bread Olympics, and uh, and so how did how did you get kind of uh, pulled deeper into the bread side? Well, uh, getting kicked into the deep end of the pool. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um. And I was really fortunate enough to be under my uncle's wing, um, and he has every connection, um, you know, on the planet in the baking world, and he was fortunate enough to send me around to a, a ton of different bakeries to get a lot of different. Uh, perspectives and skills. Um, I learned a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And um, I also had the freedom uh, to work on it. And I was uh, learning, you know, helping them out with tech support, you know, so I was exposed to a lot of problems super early on uh, in my baking cycle, you know, so just trying to figure out what's wrong. And then of course I had the other advantage of being associated with our mills. Um, so I was able to problem solve from a miller's um, yeah. uh, perspective and a baker's perspective. So I, I had a super intense education um, with a lot of influences super early on. Um, so it was, it was super overwhelming, incredibly overwhelming at the beginning. But, uh, once I was able to compartmentalize all the different bits of knowledge and, and put it into practice, it was, it was great. Well, I have to say Keith was always back when, you know, when I was, uh, still had the bakery he was always my go-to guy whenever I had any question about performance of the flour or fermentation question. He, he knew more about the the science of baking than anybody I knew at that time um, and in, in a way he was uh, way ahead of the curve because he recognized the coming artisan bread movement yeah. before any of the other mills before general mills and the only other maybe name that had any cachet in the artisan community was maybe King Arthur flower but but uh, but Keith was was pushing all that and 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 studying it himself and so more than the people that we're in the business because he would then go and be sort of their troubleshoot guy. Yeah. And, yeah. And so you got a chance to learn from him. And, uh, and I thought that it was kind of visionary in the sense that now that you were almost going almost all totally into organics, you know, he was in front of that wave and, and your grandfather, Al, I knew Al, you know, very well. Um, and we used, we, you, Keith and, and Al was his, his dad, right? Yes. And, and he was also the, the dad of your mom. Is that or your uh, yeah? Your your is he's he's your grandfather also. He's my grandfather, yes, but he's uh, it was my dad's dad. Your dad's dad, so yeah. yeah. So, so Keith and my dad are brothers. 
Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so then all of a sudden we've got central milling and, and with, you know, owned by the, the juices and Keith has his own distribution company now. So I guess when we were talking in the last episode, how do you get the ingredients from central milling uh, is one of the, one of the avenues for that through Keith Justo, uh, supply that that is one of the avenues if you live in the san francisco bay area um but if you're outside of the san francisco bay area um uh, we get it through our website or we have um, all sorts of other types of distribution uh from the u.s foods cisco a lot of independents in a lot of different areas uh, so, so a lot of a lot of the distributors are carrying it now correct uh, yes that, and that's you know that's not a that, that's a major accomplishment from my standpoint to break into an industry that's already got recognized brands to come kind of come in as the new kid on the block and be able to grab market share. Uh, yeah. And that's a well, testament to the quality of your product, really. Well, we definitely have something unique. And one is uh, organic flour, because at, at the time we were getting into a lot of these distributors, there wasn't a huge pool for organic flour. There was very few people that did it. And plus we had supply. So we had the grain supply behind it. So we can supply the organic flour consistently for a bakery year round. Um, so when we were first starting, that was, that didn't really exist. You know, like nobody was able to do that at, at quantity, you know, bulk flour loads, you know, truckloads of flour, organic flour consistently year round with right. the same exact wheat blends and that sort of thing. So and that that's has how we really built our companies able to do that and that's all about relationships right because you know the relationships with the farmers and the millers yeah the relationship with the farmer is honestly the most important component for our business um, that and of course the relationship with the baker and like making that cycle work the the baker the farmer and the miller yeah. and i say baker farmer and miller because that's how we think of it you know it's yeah. like we don't just give the baker every, you know, whatever we can give them. You know, it's more like, okay, the baker is needing this, you know, specific type of flour. He wants this performance out of it. He wants this, these wheat, this wheat blend or whatever it might be um, uh, that they're envisioning. And then we go talk to the farmers and, and get those grains grown um, uh, consistently and then mill them to, to give back to the baker. So it's a nice cycle that way. And I've seen over the years sort of an evolution, even in your product line of uh, uh, blends, flour blends, perhaps you would call them, uh, of, uh, or that are specifically suited to different purposes as the pizza movement began to explode and, and people wanted uh, the double zero flour, things like that. All of a sudden, you know, you had that. And, yeah. uh, and when they wanted uh, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, particular kind of baguette flour that would match up with the French style flour, you know, you were able to source and, and mill that for them as well. And even work, I think, with certain uh, well-known bakers, like companies like uh, like Tony Gemignani in the pizza world or, yeah. Yeah. or uh, maybe Acme Breads in the bread world to create customized blends, either just for them or a blend that could then be made available to others who were trying to emulate them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'd, we'd love bakers because I mean, we are bakers at heart first, you know, um, uh, at least the, the Justo side of our, our family is the bake the Perry side of our family and um, that's you know more farmers first so I mean it's a really good combination so we have all these in-depth deep-rooted perspectives you know for for the business and then we come there at the mill and, and, and what a lot of people don't know about uh, your the Justo mill name or the central mine is that you were also maybe the original uh, your family was the original sprouted bread company. Your, your family was making sprouted bread before Ezekiel bread and before Alvarado street bread and before everybody else back yeah. in the 1950s or maybe late forties in San Francisco, you had, right. was it Justo Vitagrain? Yes. And, Justo and I've Vitagrain. had that bread. And I remember Keith used to, you know, actually oversee that operation too, until finally, I think they, it just was too much to keep everything going. And uh, sure enough, you know, now sprouted grains are big. Yep. And so you have also history of that and are making sprouted um, sprouted grain pulp, I guess, or mash mm -hmm. available to a number of uh, clients as well, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. Our Justo side of the family has a, uh, uh, a knack for being way ahead of their time, you know, I mean, to our, to our, our detriment, you know, we're always like coming yeah. out with something and then it, then it just doesn't work and then we scrap it and then it becomes popular a few years <laughs> later. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a, we have a history of a few different aspects of that, you know, sometimes, not, sometimes. not even in the 
from where you, you know, it's like my, my great grandfather opened up uh, some mud baths in Calistoga in the, in the late seventies. Right? And, and he's like, this isn't working. Nobody <laughs> wants to come sold it off. And then the mid eighties went, <laughs> like, but timing is everything. Right? <laughs> timing is everything. And we're the worst at it. <laughs> well, you know, it's sometimes it's, uh, I've been told sometimes it's, it's not always great to be the first. Sometimes you're better off being second uh, after the guy who went first went, went out of business but paved the way for you. Yeah, you know? yeah. But uh, we haven't learned that lesson yet. <laughs> but, 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 you, but, but I think it's kind of cool that you're bringing the sprouted side back. You're the yeah. primary provider of almost any company that's using uh, fresh sprouted mash as opposed yeah. to sprouted flour, which is another category, which uh, I, I think you also have sprouted flour, dry flour, or are you focusing on the mash? We're just focusing on the mash now. We're uh, we kind of shut down the flour aspect of it just because the energy consumption that goes into it is so great. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out a different way of doing it, and we have. Um, we're just trying to like figure out how to bring it to market. Um, uh, but the mash itself is, is, is something incredibly unique. And, unique, you know, totally unique. With, and, with, and the healthiest way to eat grain. If yeah, you, if you can say with all the with all the negative press that, that grain gets from writers, you know they the say grain, grain, and all that stuff. Uh, sprouted grain is a whole different thing. It's like yes. totally nutritious. Yeah, uh, all the uh, the the natural aspects of the flour has been unlocked through the sprouting process, and everything's bioavailable for your body to digest. It's a, it's yeah. a magical thing. It is and, magical, and with and, food and safety the way it is right now, you know, it's like a lot of bakeries just can't do it in house or right. don't want to because it's super labor intensive, or their food safety programs, you know, will don't want them to do it. Yeah, because it's um, tricky to do it right. It's so, so they yeah, can buy frozen like chubs of of sprouted grain from you, have it arrive frozen, they can just thaw it out in their refrigerators and then yep. use it in their breads. Yeah, and a lot of pizza companies are using it as well now too, which is really nice. Um, I expect to see more and more and more of this happening because you know, it's when you when you just break it down in terms of like logic, it's, mm -hmm. it's a no brainer. It's just learn, it's about learning how to use it to be able to retain the quality. And I think some people are afraid that it's gonna cause maybe less rise in their bread, less puff, this and that, so those are, and that, which leads me to, um, before we run out of time in this episode, uh, that this all kind of moved into now as part of your business, you've got an artisan baking center Correct. in Petaluma. I've been there. I've taught classes mm -hmm. there. I've, I've been in classes there. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that and how that works. Yeah, so the Artisan Baking Center in our distribution company in Petaluma, California, and it's a, it's a, it's a place that we designed to be an educational center for artisan baking. Um, and uh, we do everything from pizza classes to artisan bread, from foundation classes to people, you know, from people that haven't touched dough before all the way to, you know, the most advanced baking techniques. Um, and we're starting to branch out into other things as well, because um, as you know, being a part of Johnson Wales, you know, the, the educational center hard to uh, make a business out of it and we're not trying to make a business but we're just trying to have it pay for itself so we're having to uh, uh, branch out into a bunch of other things um, but it's 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 working and it's it's a it's a wonderful place to come in the wine country and uh we it's more about the in-depth workshop style uh, uh education as opposed to like a certified you know like school so it's it's like weekend workshops you know two days one day a couple hours depending on the class and sometimes uh, professional development classes but exactly. also uh and the competition teams will come and do their their practice sessions you know at the yeah same time as well, yeah right? yeah yeah so throughout this last coupe cycle the coupe de monde de la blangerie we had our uh, team out uh, and practiced a lot in our place we did um scoot around to some other places too just to mix it up but um, yeah, we uh, had you come yeah, team out at our campus in, in Charlotte. Yeah, but you were the coach this time on the most recent team. You were the coach of that team, right? Yes. But on the team before that, and this competition only happens every what three or four years. Every four years. Before yeah. that, you were the captain of the yes. of the making team itself. So yes. you you had your your feet in, and this is uh, again, uh, you talk about fast tracking your own educational process. You went from knowing nothing about the baking side and the milling side, but having it in your blood to you know coming into the company learning it all and then within a number of years, a few years really, being able to actually, you know, compete at the highest level. Of, of yeah, level. yeah, it was about eight years, I think, from from the moment I intensely started working on it to the 2016 coupe, um, and then uh, the 2021 where I was the coach, yeah. I, 
think people who were raised in the French system over there would say, that's, that's absurd. You can't get to it to be a, a camp champion baker in eight years. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be at least 45 years old and have done it for 25 years professionally, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, if you're any, any, any occupation, I don't care what it is. If you're absolutely obsessed with it and you eat, sleep and breathe what you're doing, yeah. like I did, then anything's possible. And I know that also one of the, the team members of the Artists and Baking Center is Craig Ponsford, who a lot of our viewers will know and recognize. Craig was really America's first world champion. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, represented the United States of the Coupe de Monde in the 1990s, uh, yeah. early 90s, 96, I think it was. And he was the first one to win a gold medal. Correct, and that, yeah. that was even a shock. That was like when Tony Gemignani won the, the uh, you know, Margarita Championship in Naples. It was a, so, such a shock to the Italians. It must have been that way to the French when when uh, Craig Ponsford you know won the baguette category against the yeah. French in Paris in, in exactly yeah oh it's incredible for him yeah yeah, yeah it's definitely a groundbreaking so Craig is a part of your education team right he, he does a lot of class but he also organizes a lot of the classes that are being that and, and bringing in guest instructors yes yeah. yes as well yeah. as as well as your wife Ariel who's yeah. uh you know uh, you know kind of put that educational piece together so you know I hate to say it, but the time has gone so fast. We're talking about, I want to talk about so much more. So let's come back for another episode. We'll come back for another segment where, where uh, this time, Nikki, we will talk about flour. Okay, we have, all right. We've talked about everything around it. We've talked about what you're doing. And, uh, and I'm sure people are waiting to hear, you know, maybe some, some of the frequently asked questions that you get about different types of flour. Great. So, so come back um, for Pizza Talk with Nikki Justo. Another episode coming up soon. So it's been interesting hearing this this story and history of of you of of the Justo family of Central Milling. Uh, we're with Nikki Justo for those who are just joining us for the first time uh, of Central Milling, but of a lot of other things. And you know, one of the things that Nikki was telling us is this the, that the family, the Justo family, has connections in the uh, in the in the farmer side as well as the miller side as well as now the baking side as well. So you've got like all three parts of the, what I call the farmer, miller, baker collaboration. Uh, and, uh, and essentially in, in, in this new current artisan movement, we're seeing a lot more conscious work with where bakers are, are working with the millers and millers are working with specific farmers to do local farming, local milling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you guys have been doing this and it's, and it's ingrained in your blood. Yeah. And yet, Nikki, you, you decided to, that you were going to be the first family member to kind of go your own way. Your family was encouraging you, go out of the business, go do something new. And you were on a whole different track. What yeah. did pull you back? And what is it about, you know, all these different things that are part of your blood, you know, that, that are so compelling for you? Well, um, it's actually kind of a funny story. Uh, so I, I, all my summers growing up, I was always you know, with my dad at the, our packaging plant or in our, in our bakery, you know, going around, putting my hand in the brown sugar, you know, taking a handful yeah. of that, you know, sniffing the sprouted grain and cause it has a super interesting smell and all these things are, you know, became super nostalgic for me later. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, after high school and, and uh, college, you know, I decided to uh, continue my education and my, uh, I moved to England for a bit and, um, and I wasn't happy with the bread there. Uh, you know, just, and, and I was also super on a budget, <laughs> you know, just trying to like live day to day, you know, going to school, working on a master's degree there. And, um, uh, I decided to start picking up baking again, um, just to, as, as a hobby, cause I didn't have a lot of friends, you know, I was just like grinding in school and doing this stuff. And so I just started baking, but I lived on a flat with, uh, uh with a bunch of, um, folks from, from Greece and um, and from Nigeria, and they were huge into these massive meals. Like every week, they had to like fill up this kitchen. Like all these people would come over and a common meal. Yeah, and everybody would contribute something to it, you know. Yeah. And it's like ah, oh, the the baker man. I was always the baker man, you know. So because I was always baking something, and um, and I would just supply all these folks there. And then I started, you know, calling my uncle, you know, super expensive phone calls back then, <laughs> you know, just like, Hey, I got two minutes to talk, you know, it's like, Hey, tell me what to do with this sourdough, you know, and he would like spread off a bunch of stuff and then I'd lose the call. And, um, I, I don't know. It just got 
obsessive with it then, but then I, I was recruited back to the United States after I finished my degree um, to San Rafael to a software company and I did uh, product design for a, a architectural design software. And um, I would just, I'd still I'd be obsessed with baking. Um, and of course here, the Mecca of food, you know, everywhere you go, there's all these great bakeries to go visit this and that. And at the time my uncle had his bakery up in Petaluma and full circle. And I would have these full circle. Was it called full circle baking? Full circle baking company. Full yeah. Circle. Yeah. yeah. Reds coming out of there. Yeah. And I've, I'd, I'd get a couple of weeks off every few months, you know, and I, I'd go spend that time in his bakery, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you think I would go and like, go yeah. do something. I'll sit on a beach or something, but no, I was like obsessed with it, you know? And um and uh at that point it was the, the deal was sealed you know and i was just like trying to figure out how to get out of my job and like yeah, yeah. Uh, get into the bakery industry and things like that and at the time my uncle was looking for help assistant you know to help him with everything that he was doing so he can you know grow further as well so uh, that's when he took me under his wing in 2006 2007 yeah. and um that was that was it he became your yoda and yes yeah for sure said, yeah. come here grasshopper i'll teach you everything i know exactly yeah and that he did you know and you know he's awesome. a guy that can bake with you know sawdust and a campfire you know somehow get you a lump of sourdough out of it you know uh, yeah no he is a great baker and i've had a, a number of his breads and uh, learned a lot from keith yeah. justo um so which leads us you know to this the, the focus of this episode is really to talk about some of the most frequently asked questions that you get uh, yep. either from your customers or from bakers uh, about flour, you know, yes. and, and and you've got so many different kinds of flour um, uh, without turning this into sort of like a, a flour 101, you know, what are some of the questions that maybe come your way most often? Uh, lately, it's been, can I make sourdough bread with this? You know, you know, during doing. the pandemic, you know, everybody's like making yeah. sourdough bread. It's like, okay, what's the best flour for sourdough bread? And really my answer is like any flour you can get your hands on, you know, you just, with the beauty about sourdough it's you know the acid strengthens the protein you know so you can bake with like pretty low protein flour and make some exceptional tasting bread out of it that has a decent amount of volume so it's like it's a really funny thing that you know it's like you can make anything um with any flour you just have to have some creativity the problem i get is like most people uh, the part i see is that most people get locked into a box you know it's like they like okay to make sourdough bread i need high protein white flour or I need, uh, you know, to do this uh, bakery good, I need this uh, specific flour. Or to make pizza, I need this specific flour. And that's not the case at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a screwdriver. You know, you can tighten so many different types of screws with a single screwdriver, you know. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of it's just a tool. You just have to, you know, open up your mind and use your creativity. And, uh, you know, some one flour might give you a little bit more color in your crust or a little bit more uh uh you know less volume but more flavor or more volume and less flavor like whatever it might be you know it's just all in your your fermentation technique your I, handling and, I remember a few years ago you and I worked together on kind of developing some little pizza flour blends that we yeah. would package up and, and make available and so we did use different flours to try to create flavor profiles uh, including malting using a lot of malted yep. flour in, mm -hmm. in the in the mix or rye, rye flour, and then textures was another big thing that comes oh, up. Textures a lot. huge. There's you know, a coarsely ground flour and a finely milled flour. Um, and that's, I mean, that was one of a turning point in my my edu my bakery education is when I discovered texture in the crumb and like the different things that you can achieve with different granulations of flour from different milling techniques and different ash levels, uh, different granulations of whole grain, different varieties, and like they all change the crumb of your pizza or your bread or whatever you're making, you know, so drastically. And you can make something incredibly unique with just a simple granulation change, you know, and it's, it's, it's incredibly inspiring. Uh, some things that people would need to know, like about how the different granulations affect performance, what's the functionality of, of the grind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in broad strokes, you know, the finer the grind, the more volume you'll get, you know, typically, and you know, the, the coarser the grind, the less volume you'll get. Um, so that's a kind of a visual aspect of it. It also the, affects your water really, absorption. You can't really develop if, it's, if the flour is not broken down completely into a powder. Yeah, if it's not coarse enough, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I mean, you need the endosperm, you need that um, uh, that bit to really get the gluten development because there's no gluten developing properties, and of course, in the bran or the germ, you know, it's yeah. all in the proteins of the uh, of the endosperm. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but as long as you have enough of that in there, <laughs> then you can do whatever you want. Right. You know. So. 
Another question yeah. that people ask me a lot, so I'm going to throw questions at you that people ask me and I give the best answer I can, but I, I want to punt to the guy who's doing this professionally, um, is uh, do I need to use a vital wheat gluten to make my dough stronger? And when is it appropriate to add vital wheat gluten, which is just pure gluten derived from wheat without all the starch and everything? When is it appropriate to add that and, and, and how much should I use? I mean, really a home baker doesn't need vital wheat gluten unless you're baking with, you know, uh, and trying to make a uh, super low protein cake flour into bread. You know, it's just, it's just, to me, it's just not necessary. Um, vital wheat gluten is a tool for industrial bakers, you know, to, uh, to maximize low volume out of a pan bread or something like that. You know, it's, it's a, it's a tool and you should use it in smaller amounts. Um, but there's some, there's some cases uh, like with the sprouted grain, for example, where uh, if, if the grain is sprouted to a specific point, you know, if it's gluten developing properties are minimized a little bit. So you need to reinforce that. It needs a little bit of help. Um, um, so adding some vital wheat gluten to that will help you get more volume out of a sprouted product um, or grains that are uh, uh, like if you're milling at home and you have really small, tiny kernels of like, say, emmer uh, that you're working with um, and you're and you want a little bit more volume out of your loaf of emmer bread that you're doing, you know, adding a, like a couple percent of vital wheat gluten will help strengthen that up and get you a little bit more power. And I know people do add it to like rye bread since rye flour only has about half the amount of gluten of wheat flour. So, but what percentage would be like uh, the max that you should go? Because uh, I use my, my rule of thumb always was never add more than 2%. But I've heard of some breads that add as much as 10% yes, of yeah. wheat flour wheat. Um, it really, it's a question you ask your accountant. You know, like <laughs> it's a lot more expensive, right? <laughs> yes, it's incredibly expensive, especially when you deal with organic stuff. You know, it's like uh, true, okay, yeah. you know, you're you're north of three bucks a pound for some of this in some cases. You know, so it's like whoa, you know, so little little as you can get away with, and you, you know, you're almost better off using some other techniques. You know, for strengthening your protein, like the the acids in sourdough, or even some ascorbic acid or something like that. It's like, uh -huh. you can so use them in smaller quantities and with somewhat of the same effect. Just work around. Um, and ascorbic but, acid is a good uh, point because uh, a lot of flours, especially white flour that you buy, it will say, it used to say uh, uh, potassium bromide or something like that was oh, one yeah. of the additives. And then that's gotten pulled out because mm -hmm. the, uh, it's carcinogenic. Shown that it could be carcinogenic. So mm -hmm. now we use ascorbic acid to do the same thing. What does that do? Uh, and how does that affect the, the rise of the bread? Ah, so the ascorbic acid is a is a it's a basically vitamin C, but it reinforces protein. I like to think of it as as um, you know you have a bubble, right? Um, and you, you know you blow a bubble and it's pretty thin and fragile, you know. But the ascorbic acid during uh, the, uh, the, the 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 gluten development it reinforces the outside of that bubble. It gives that bubble more strength. Um, but it also, in some cases, if you use too much of it, will make it too strong. So it'll make that bubble so it just can't expand after a certain point. So you'll notice if you use a lot of ascorbic acid, you'll get a really tight crumb. So you can use it as an effect to, to tighten up a crumb, like say in a pandemie or something where you want a, a, a very tight crumb that yeah. you don't want your things to fall through. But if you, if you just want volume out of it, you use a very little amount just to reinforce it enough to, um, to, to maintain its shape through the bake cycle. But I, I'm everything saying, burns I, off. I remember when Raymond Calvel, the great French baker, came and was teaching his techniques of baguettes. I would add some, and he took a little pen knife out, and he put like just, it was almost like you could barely see it, a little bit of ascorbic acid at the end of his pen knife, and put that into the into the the twenty pounds of dough, and he said, yeah. "That's all you need." Yeah, a little goes a long way. That's for sure, um, because yeah, it has a negative effect after a certain point, and, and it makes like, the dough really strong and bucky. Bucky, which means it kind of like buckles when it bakes and gets you get kind of waffle tops and stuff. Well, like that. more when you're shaping it, like uh, in pizza land, you know. So if you're pushing out a pizza dough and you're trying to push out that disc and it keeps snapping back like a rubber band. That means your dough is too strong, and typically, when you have, uh, you know, some uh, I'm trying to blank on some of the names, so some of the more popular white flours out there that are around um, uh, have ascorbic acid in it, and if you don't hydrate it enough uh, to make it extensible, it it's super bucky and hard to get a large pizza out of you know your dough. Like a rubber band, el elastic. It's very elastic. Yeah. 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 
So that's that's interesting. So hydration, which is another category that people want to know. How much water should I add? And, and how do I know what the tolerance of my flower is for hydration? And, yeah. I'm, and I'm guessing that the part of that answer is that all flowers have different tolerances. Correct, yeah. And it depends on, you know, how much... Uh, 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 water was added during the tempering process, even if, if it was even tempered. Um, uh, how long has the flower been sitting? A, a flower loses a lot of moisture sitting in the distribution channel between the mill and uh, your pizza shop or your bakery. Um, so it loses moisture there. Um, you know, some grains are just inherently more thirsty than others. Um, you know, so there's a lot of factors that go into it, but generally speaking, I mean, you can, you can properly, you can hydrate uh, almost to any level with a flower, you know, like 100% is not unheard of, even with white flour. By the way, I don't know if you can hear, but now my lawn mower guy has shown up. I hear him in the back. It's like yours showed up Shoot. in the first episode. <laughs> um, so what you're saying is, is that uh, there's a big range, and but your dough and your dough will pretty much dictate to you how much it can handle. Yeah, and and you know, my my buddy Mike Sikowski, um you know, said this first. I heard it from him first. Is uh, is you know, you hydrate the dough properly. What does that mean? You know, it's kind of a broad term, but you have to like think about it. So say you got a, a your pizza shop and you have a bunch of new people in there and yeah. they're not very skilled with handling dough. You're not going to hand them over a super wet dough and say, Hey, go to production with this in our busiest time, you know? Um, you know, so you, you need to think about, you know, like the mechanics of the dough, you know, the more water you have, the harder it is to handle. Uh, but it does give you that nice airy result that you want, you know, in your crumb. But you know, it's it's all about the proper hydration for the application and application, not the specific, you know, final product. It's the entire thing, the production of the product that you need to take into account. I see. Now, is this true or false that the higher the protein amount of your flour, let's say a high protein flour or a high gluten flour, that more protein usually takes more water than a lower protein flour or Gen generally speaking yes yeah but if you look at um, if you look at spelt it's a good example spelt is incredibly high in protein typically you know 15 16 percent protein on the high end of the scale yeah. but it absorbs about as much water or it can absorb about as much water as like a, a low protein bread flour or even a a, 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 a pastry flour for example um, maybe a little bit it's you know it doesn't it's not as thirsty and it's a very high protein grain. Is that because but, protein is not necessarily gluten forming protein, but other kinds of proteins? Yeah, you have the, the quality of the protein and the quantity of protein. We like to separate those two things. You could have something with high in protein, but the, the gluten uh, uh, quality is low, like in spelt flour and in some cases, depending on the varietal. Or you can have like something like Corazon, um, which is super thirsty, super high in protein, and also really strong. Um, so it, it really depends on the variety, the grain, and uh, a lot of other factors. Well, you mentioned a couple of terms that maybe not everybody's aware of, like Corazon and Emmer and what now would be maybe categorized as ancient grain strains yeah. of wheat, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, and they're all matches. kind of, they go back to the old Egyptian, early Mesopotamian era of, of bread baking uh, before the modern wheat came in. And they're coming back. It's a big thing. And are you seeing that in your business that there's a, a growing demand for these ancient grains? And uh, and performance-wise, what are some of the things that people should know about when working with those kinds of ancient grains? Um, yes, yeah, it's definitely have a, have, having a resurgence. Um, you know, depending on the market that you're in, it has been super popular with the artisan bread bakers for you know five, six, maybe even eight years now. Um, but it, it's working its way into all these other parts of the bakery world, which is really exactly. cool. We're seeing it in um, snack foods, we're seeing it in pizzas, we're seeing it. In yeah, breakfast cereal, it's crazy. Yeah. But so, um, the important thing to think is that it's not everything is exactly like wheat. You know, most people will get this grain, like rye, for example, and they'll look like, oh, it's just like wheat, and they'll hydrate it the same and try to mix it out the same. And no, you got like mortar <laughs> in a bucket, you know, yeah. or in, or like the spelt, for example, where you you know you try to make it the same, and it's you know it's not as thirsty. Your dough's super wet. It's hard to handle. The mix time's really short. Or corazon, where the mix time really or can be really long and super thirsty. So it's I mean, every grain has a, a little different rule of thumb to, to, to go oh, on. Corazon, when you say Corazon, is that the same thing as what some people know as this Kamut? Kamut, yes, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a branded version of Corazon. Corazon is the more generic name, and Kamut is a brand, a, a brand version of 
of that ancient Corazon grain. Yeah, it's like a, 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 a Kleenex. All, let's see, all, all Kleenex is a tissue, but not all <laughs> tissues are Kleenex. It's a Kleenex, right. So <laughs> what are the different properties between the Corazon, the Spelt, and the Emmer? Those are the three ancient grains that I think of. There's also Durham flower, which is another category, which is ancient, but also modern. But what are the, what are the properties that differentiate those? Is it a genetic thing? Is it the, is it the molecular structure? It's the genetics, yeah. So like uh, uh, you have uh, spelt, um, emmer, and einkorn. Those are all cousins of each other. Yeah, so they have, you know, and they're the Faro family, I call them. You know, a lot of people call them that. But like Faro piccolo is einkorn, which is the oldest variety that we know of. Um, and then that was crossbred naturally, you know, over time to make emmer. And then emmer um, over time was crossbred uh, naturally and, and that became spelt. So you have faro piccolo, faro medio, and faro grande, wow. uh, which is really neat. So that's a nice little trio family there. But then you have are the durum. Are they actually small, medium, and large in size? Uh, when you look at the grains, you know, generally speaking, they are, you know, uh, einkorn is quite small um, or can be quite small. Emmer is um, kind of a mix, you know, they have like longer kernels and shorter kernels. Um, and then spelt can be a little on the short side, but nice and plump. Uh, of and, those, of all of those, the ones that, the one that I find to be the most is the einkorn. But yes. are there any tips that you might have before we run out of time today, some tips for people that are trying to work with those that in terms of how to work best with these ancient grains? A sourdough process, definitely a sourdough process with einkorn. That's a, Why that's is a secret. That? Because the, uh, the acids of the sourdough, when you get a lower pH, it helps reinforce what little protein it has. Oh, yeah. So it gives it some strength. It gives it some strength, yes. Yeah. And, and, and if you're baking 100% einkorn, put it in a pan. <laughs> I'm trying to do freestanding loaf. Yeah, yeah. Freestanding loaf is possible depending on the quality of the einkorn you're uh, working with, but generally speaking, it's, you know, you, it, yeah, yeah. Um, what about mixing? Do they have, can they tolerate less mixing, more mixing? What, what's the best way to mix the older grains? Those are uh, a lot on the, on the lower end. Low um, mixing. So they're, yeah. Yeah, they're definitely, you know, very short mixes where you want to, you know, pull them off and then uh, finish developing with, with your folds. That way you can feel the strength of the dough. Um, uh, but generally speaking, yeah, keep it on the lower side of things, except for rye. Rye is one thing you want to mix out quite a bit, even though it doesn't look like you're getting any development in it. Uh -huh. You actually are releasing pentazans in it. That yeah. uh, It's a gel that basically traps gas. Um, and so you need to actually agitate oh, the I rye. I thought that you had to mix rye shorter because it gets gummy because of the pentazans. <laughs> Understanding that? Yeah, you want it. You want to give it a little bit more mix time. If you look at a lot of the older German rye uh, formulas, you know, um, uh, actually a lot of modern ones now too, is like you're mixing it for you know eight to up to fifteen minutes in some cases, you know, and it's just to and, and you can notice it in the dough too. If it's a hundred percent, it starts out as a dull color and then starts to get glossy, and once it starts to get glossy, that's when the, that gel is present, um, uh -huh. um, and then you take it off and then go through your fermentation cycle and bake from there. Uh, that's an interesting one. This is a world, and you know, and back when we, when I started my bakery in the 1980s, all we knew, knew was, you know, four minutes on speed one, six minutes on speed two. You know, nobody thought about all of these subtleties, and then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know the microscopic level, the molecular yeah. level of of bread making, dough making, pizza making, and. Cool. Uh, Thank God that we got people now who can help explain that. So yeah, we are in a magical time of bread baking right now. It is incredible. I mean, we have all these tools. You know, we have everything that's accessible through the internet. You know, you can have stuff of this huge variety of things delivered to you. It's uh, like, like if you're just getting into bread now, or uh, a, an operator that's wanting to go to the next level right now. I mean, it is just a magical time to do it. Um, I mean, you have things from uh, the ancient grains. I mean, just crazy varieties of extraction of different wheats, uh, but also the sprouted products as well. I mean, you have all these cool tools that are out there that um, will help inspire you and help make products that are different. And I always say that uh, even after 6,000 years of bread making, we're still learning new ways to make it even better. <laughs> well, basically, we're just stumbling onto the stuff that somebody <laughs> forgot about. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe they did make it that good back then. Who knows? But, yeah. but also, we know a lot more now. We can bring the worlds of science and craft together. And, uh, and so if people want to track you down, if they need, if they want either to pick your brain for information or they want to know about your product line, to find you. Uh, Centralmilling.com um, is the best way for our products to check out our stuff there. And um, 
if you want to contact me directly, um, my, my email's out there. It's at njusto at centralmilling.com. I'm open to all questions and everything. I all love right. It. Thank you. Thank you. We could talk for hours. I know I could talk with for hours. I don't know if everybody can hang with us for that amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> we could get really geeky about this, but I love talking about all this stuff with you. I love the, I loved having known you from when you first got into it till now and seen this incredible growth curve. Uh, uh, you were, you've I mean, been such an amazing inspiration to me, Peter, you know, from that very first time we baked together in, in Colorado, in Colorado. Denver, yeah. And, we was, went at, at Whole Foods uh, Bakehouse, I yeah. think, is the first time we yeah. did. Andy uh, Clark and all that. Andy oh, Clark, who's going to, we're, we're hoping to have him on Pizza Talk sometime soon because he's done some amazing things with his little Moxie Bakery now that yeah. he's doing outside of Denver. Uh, so, yeah. So, the, the world, the red world, the pizza world, they're all kind of coming together. You're one of the companies that Pizza that is, you know, you're like right on the borderline there between the bread expo and the pizza expo. People from both of those sites come to you uh, for, you know, to, to ask you and Craig and, and your team questions and to watch you guys making things and yeah. also to probably uh, make, make deals to buy flour. So, yeah. so, so anybody who's, uh, you know, is interested in, in uh, getting more information, go to the website, uh, get to know uh, Nikki, uh, hopefully when we start gathering again at these various expos and shows, you'll get to meet him in person. And uh, again, well, we'd love to have you come back. Maybe we'll do some more. Maybe if, if any of you have questions about uh, about flour that you would like me, Nikki, for a future episode, write to me at peter at pizzaquest.com. I'll collect those questions and maybe we'll have a whole standalone episode sometime where we just do, you know, questions. We do throw questions at you if you're up for it. That'd be great. I'd love to be uh, part of that. All right. Well, thank you again, Nikki Justo, for, for being part of Pizza Talk and for uh, also being a big a supporter of Pizza Quest because you were one of our early, you know, actually early uh, sponsor of Pizza Quest and helped us yeah. get this thing off the ground. So again, thanks for supporting the entire baking movement and the, and the knowledge uh, and education movement of, of the baking side as well. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for everything that you're doing for the bread world. You're, uh, I, is, you're giving it all and you have I, for your I love life. I'm loving getting to talk with all you guys. So please give my best to your wife, Ariel, and to uh, Craig and everybody at, at the Team Keith. Uh, please tell them all hi. See you, you know, hopefully soon Perfect. in person. And we'll hopefully see all of you who are watching at the next episode of Pizza Talk. Thanks for joining us today.